Welcome back to part two of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way, featuring our special guests. Now let's dive right back into the conversation and continue exploring their incredible journey. I mean, how often do we even do that to just literally sit down, turn off everything and ask yourself and expect an honest answer. What do you want? Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, completely agree. And it's a really good point. It really is. I, it, it's hard though, isn't it? It is hard to do that because you, you feel like you're going to put more distance in between you and the loved ones in your life. But it's so important mm. that you can put that space just to have that mental clarity that just a starting point of that race to get going. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, no, I Move. think, and that's, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, yeah, you go, you go. I think that's really, you make a really important point is that our initial feeling, and again, that's leaning into the fear. Like if I yeah. reclaim my time and if I reclaim my worth, will that alienate me from the people that I really want to connect with in my life? And I think, you know, I know you're a parent, I'm a parent and what I have experienced and so many people have experienced by really stepping into their worth um, saying, no, you know, I'm putting my flag in the sand. This is me. This is me, my body, my spirit, my soul, my opinions. This is me. I'm going to stay true to me. I'm going to protect my time. When you do that and you show children and you show, you know, for me, other women in my life, uh, when you show people who are maybe in a vulnerable situation that their voice matters, that they do get to decide that they're allowed to choose themselves you are gifting them a sense of empowerment and possibility that is far greater than your gifts of just cutting off little pieces of yourself and handing them out for free without yeah. really any bene any benefit to anyone when you empower someone that's a much greater gift and and my children since seeing me come into my own have a far different perspective on life and I see them developing in this amazing way every day and saying things to me that just really reaffirm my choices to show up for myself because they are learning, you know, especially my daughters, they are learning that not only is it okay, that it is expected that they show up for themselves and they protect themselves in life and that they don't just give themselves away for free in every way that that means. Yeah, so important. Yeah, it's 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 really important to practice putting boundaries up, isn't it? Really mm -hmm. important to practice, even if it's just the small ones. I feel like we we've been doing that as a family recently a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, but I I do it pulls on the heartstrings a little bit. But let let's move back to what you're doing. I've got a picture here. Let's go on to some of the little things that you're doing. No, I keep saying little things. They're not little. They're huge. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it's so not little. It's huge. Um, I've got your little logo of your um, your talks with Dr. Schaefer. Can you talk to us a little bit um, about that? And I'll put everything yeah. in the show notes if everybody is interested as well to make contact uh, or have a listen as well. Talk to us a little thanks. bit about your project here. Yeah, thank you for showing that. I'm really proud of the logo. I love that. I love that um, kind of um, watercolor art and, and the, the slightly cursive, um, you know, it speaks to our, our generation, right? You and I are pretty much the same age. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, we are. Yeah. But no, I am so passionate about talks with Dr. Schaefer. It really evolved as I was in what I call the messy middle, I'm an mm. auditory processor and a code for I, I talk a lot. <laughs> Me too. I'm famous for it. <laughs> I also write, but I find for myself talking to be really healing. Um, and so for me along my journey, I started to create little short reels and a part of me leaning into my fear, what had happened was people were reaching out to me when I was feeling really hopeless and lost and like I didn't have a voice for my privacy. I'd changed my number several times. I really was not getting out into the community. So I felt, you know, pretty bunkered down and women were finding me somehow, texting me, reaching out to me uh, and saying, you know, an acquaintance or, or someone I didn't even know gave me your number. 
I'm going through a rough time and they suggested I speak to you because you could, you could help me. And that was really impactful for me because here I am still in my messy middle and still really buying into some of the limiting beliefs, working really hard to try to rewire my mindset and, and my habits of my internal voice. And so having that little bit of external reminder that, no, like you, you are important. You are helping people. Even when you're feeling at your lowest, you matter. That was really impactful for me. And so I recognized one, that I could help people in a one-on-one way. And I really went down that road of learning about how I could do that. And I came upon life coaching, which was just such an incredible learning journey for me to, to do the studies, to become a certified life coach. But a part of that too was, you know, I, I've always been a bit frustrated by the format of only one-on-one, uh, even in medicine, you know, just when you're one-on-one with patients, that's very limited with your time as a resource, how many people you can reach. And we have so much we need to share with people. Uh, when I was seeing uh, patients uh, in, in the community that I live in, I was having on average an 18 to 22 month wait list. So, <laughs> you know, you can't see as many people as you want to in that traditional system. And the beauty of social media and creating content and creating reels is that you can take a discussion that you would have had one on one and turn it into a reel that you know, sky's the limit on who can be impacted by that information. So I started that really short form content creation. And based on the feedback that I was receiving daily and my, you know, direct messages um, and people contacting me otherwise, I, I recognized that it was impactful. Often the the reels that I was maybe a bit nervous about putting out because they were quite deep and vulnerable and and maybe a bit painful for me. Those were even the ones that people really felt and connected with the most. So on that journey of making that short form content, I came to the point where I decided to start a podcast Mm -hmm. and uh, started with solo episodes. And then this spring, I really branched out into working with guests and have continued the solo episodes because of the feedback I get from my audience about really wanting to have those more meditative like discussions where it's just, you know, one voice you're hearing, um, but also have been just so inspired by the people that I've been able to meet and the, sh- the stories that they are so generously sharing with me and with my audience. It has been an incredible experience. And I, I would say it's one of my favorite things that that I do on a day in day out basis. Yeah, I, I mean, you you being vulnerable yourself created that safe space, didn't it, for other people? Mm-hmm. You, I mean, you acknowledge that they connected with you the most when you were being vulnerable. That's how powerful it was, even though you had all that presence of that fear and anxiety around it. Um, mm-hmm. Just being vulnerable. Um, opens up that safe space for everybody else to kind of let go and, and, and open up and connect, doesn't it? Because they realize they're not on their own. Because a lot of people go through trauma and they realize they think that they're solely on their own. Everything goes gray and it's just, boom, lonely as hell, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But we're not alone in our trauma. We're we're pretty much all like little trauma bubbles walking around, bumping into each other and not acknowledging yeah. one another's trauma. And And I think if we change that, the power we could harness for good is really incredible. And I want to just be a small, a small part of that. Mm. You know, you know, it's not a small part. You, you, you're obviously doing big things. Um, you, you've got some other wonderful things going on um, in terms of um, your books and, and your daughter and your son. Let's, shall we come back to that? I want to, you've, you've spoke about your messy middle, um, but let's go way mm. back before you messy middle uh, and before you started to transition back into the light or leading your own way yeah. where did it all begin for you where did it what what was life like uh, when you were younger and where did everything seem to 
to go for you? Mm-hmm. No, I mean, that's, that's an interesting question. I think, you know, it's really important. So if you reach out to a coach to kind of bring it back from, from where I am now to where it all begins, when, when you reach mm-hmm. out to a coach, often people have a very specific goal, right? They've got this big goal. Um, you need to actually help them find the real goal, which is usually a bit beyond the goal that they're coming to you with. But then you do have to reach back and do a lot of processing of the past because the roadblocks between you and the big goal or or the medium-sized goals or even the smaller goals are often things that are related to past traumas, right? Because we we all have them. And some of them are like big traumas and some of them are small. But depending upon how it impacted us and our nervous system, it could have a big impact on how we live our lives. So, you know, for me, um, I certainly had things happen to me as a young person that were very challenging and growing up maybe when I did and the family system that I did, it was not necessarily encouraged to really dive into processing those things. It was more of a move on, you know, soldier on. And that's something that's really important to me with sharing stories um, of especially survivors of things like abuse and other traumatic events is trying to encourage people to educate the masses that we do need to cope with trauma from the beginning. If it's already happened, we do need to go back and process it, but we need to see trauma differently in the moment so that we are empowering people to move forward in their lives. Because if they're just carrying around these undealt with issues, they're going to inform their decisions moving on, on, on. And I know that you working in the education system, I'm sure you you see that. You see decisions being made by young people that, you know, if you say, Bobby, why why did you hit Jenny? Well, because she annoyed me. Well, no, Bobby didn't hit Jenny because she annoyed him. He hit Jenny because X, Y, Z happened in his development and he has bad boundaries and he has bad anger management and he has all of these challenges that are not necessarily because he's a bad kid. It's just what he's grown up with and it hasn't been dealt with. It hasn't been processed. It hasn't been even acknowledged. Right. And so when I think back to my uh, childhood, what I ended up doing as a way to try to process what I had experienced as a young person was I wrote a lot of music and I became a singer, songwriter, producer as a very young person. I was professionally working in the music industry when I was 14, which was a way to process things, but it also was a way, as is often the case, to kind of repeat those traumatic patterns. You know, here I am a very young woman. I'm usually the only woman in the room. I'm usually with, you know, men who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s um, that are artists, engineers, producers, you know, VP of marketing of, you know, large organizations, et cetera. So I'm this very young, vulnerable person with these big goals, don't know how to achieve them. And I'm in this room with people that there's a huge power differential. Right. And so I think as much as the songwriting was a really important thing for me, I was also in a quite vulnerable position. And that led to re traumatization and to reinforcing those beliefs about what my value was, about my degree of worth, you know, what that translated to. And as a songwriter and singer at that time, as a young teenage uh, girl in the music industry, you know, your worth was that you wrote these bops, you know, they were often sexual in nature, uh, even though you were 14 or 15 (laughs) and you're writing and singing about things that are, that are, you know, you don't understand and are too mature, but you're mirroring what you hear on the radio from Madonna and the likes, you know, these wonderful artists, but they're, they're at a different place in their life than you. So Going through those yeah. things and being in those situations with people who were of a much higher level of of power and influence than me, it I think reinforced some of those patterns. And then I ended up trying to find a false sense of stability and marrying very very young, uh, which you know I I 
you know, not to make a blanket statement, but I wouldn't recommend, and I certainly um, wouldn't recommend marrying very quickly, which I I did. Um, we got engaged very, very quickly. And I felt like, okay, I found my worth, right? You know, it was just another opportunity to to show my worthiness, to have it validated by this external source, by this person. Uh, they must really know me. They must really love me. But just like in the music mm. industry, they just loved your product, right? So I became entangled in that. And it really took a long time and a lot of growing up. And again, my friend really shaking my soul and saying, hey, are are we going to break this pattern? Are are you going to start seeing yourself as worthy? Because this is, as far as we know, your one life. Is this what you want to do with it? Is this how you want to live? And so to cycle back to my mission, one of my clear missions is to really help people hopefully earlier in the process to see their worthiness and to stop looking for a sense of fitting in amongst all of these other people and other situations, but really seek a sense of belonging to yourself. And once you can accomplish that, which you don't have to be 40 to accomplish that. You can do that as a teenager. You can do that as 20-year-olds. We see these inspiring young people who really belong to themselves. Once you Mm -hmm. can accomplish that, then you can go out and make connections with people that soothe your soul instead of making you constantly feel like you have to jump through the next hoop. You have to accomplish the next thing to feel worthy rather than just showing up in a place where you are appreciated for who you are and then you feel like, okay, now I can be myself. And when you're yourself, the, just the, the way you can grow and accomplish things, it's astronomically greater than when you're trying to fit yourself in a box that's too small for you. Yeah. When, when I think of your story, I don't know, I've just, even just last night, I was watching the, um, you know, the Piers Morgan with the Kevin Spacey uh, and the industry that they were all in, you know, with that Prince Andrew and the young girls. And it, it all seems to be coming out now in the modern day about what was happening in the nineties and the, and the noughties. It, can you connect with those, those women who are now coming out a little bit because it was the music industry? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the answer is unfortunately, of course. Yeah. And um, it really harkens back to, a story, you know, at least one out of every four women has been sexually assaulted. And I think the numbers are likely higher than what's reported because what we know about that. And I was raped as a teenager. And I remember so distinctly, I was actually in a foreign country. I didn't know, you know, what to do. I was very, I felt very ashamed. I, I felt like it was my fault, even though none of that was true. Right. So I, as a 16 year old girl, drove myself to um, a place to get examined the day after. And I remember starting birth control after that because the thinking was okay, well, if I'm on birth control, when this happens to me next time, (sighs) at least I won't be as afraid that I will become pregnant. (sighs) Reflecting back on that now. I mean, genuinely problem solving mode of the kid who, you know, I was always trying to just solve the problem, right? And, oh, here's an opportunity to prevent an unwanted pregnancy through rape. I'll just be on birth control, which sounds shocking. But I think that's the reality for many women is we don't think it's if, it's it's when it happens. So how did you end up in another country? So young. I was just in traveling. Yeah, I was position. just traveling there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was just traveling there. I traveled a lot as a and, as so a young person. How old were you when you went traveling then? Uh at that point I was sixteen. And you went traveling on your own at sixteen? No, actually on that occasion I was there with my family, although it was not unusual for me to to travel alone when I was 16, you know, to go to some industry event in another state and um, you know, stay with uh the adults that were running those events. 
um, because that's who was running the event. And um, I was really seen as, you know, a a young adult who had a good head on her shoulders and and would be just fine. She could take care of things. Um, And in a way that was true, but at the same time, I was still a really young girl and that was too much responsibility to, to put on my shoulders. And I think that also just bled into choices that I made. Well, well, I should know how this goes, right? If we, there's a difference between empowering a young person and making them feel like they can't ask questions. I think that's quite dangerous when you say like, uh, when you make Mm. people feel like they're supposed to have all of the answers, then they feel wrong if they don't have the answers and they'll just make them up. And I think I, as a young person was sometimes put in the position where I just felt like I had to figure it out because everyone, you know, expected me to always know what to do. And I think when you're 14, 15, 16, 17, you know, that's, that's a difficult position to be put in. Yeah, it really is. It, you, 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 I suppose you, I remember you saying you were the young you were the young girl, the, well, the only child in the room for such a long time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you must have been you must have been so good at what you did, though, for you to be to be in that position in in the music industry. Were you what were you doing in that? Were you singing? Were you dancing? What were you doing? Tell tell us a little bit about that. I occasionally was dancing badly. I wouldn't say dancing is my strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, you know, I was in a girl group and we would dance and all of that. Uh, but no, I was usually either a solo vocalist or a lead vocalist in um, a variety of, you know, solo projects and groups. And I did a lot of also kind of ghostwriting for other uh, rhythm and blues bands. I grew up in Indianapolis oh. and R&B was really the predominant uh, genre for our area. So I did a lot of work um, and and just learned, you know, a lot of lessons really early on. I remember as a, I think I was 14 or 15 and I was in the car and I heard my song on the radio and it wasn't me singing it, but it was my lyrics and it was my melody. Um, I didn't know who was singing it. Cool. I was like, darn, someone stole my song. It's okay. Now I learned, you know, I'm like 14. I'm like, okay, I need to send my tape off to the U S you know, Congress every time. <laughs> every time I write something and do the copyright, right? So um, I learned a lot of lessons uh, as a young person and just kind of how to figure things out on my own often. Um, My mother was, you know, very supportive of me and my dreams and really helped me a lot. Um, But, you know, at the end of the day, I was really, um, you know, because she worked full time, she had a very professional position, and she, you know, trusted me very much and trusted my judgment. I was in a lot of uh, situations where um, I I had to make decisions that, you know, really, I was really too young to be put under those circumstances. And the power differential was such between myself and the adults in the room. And the goals were so different too. You know, the artist's goals and the manager's goals and the producer's goals, goals, they're not necessarily always in alignment, especially when there is that power differential. So um, I would definitely say if there's a young person in your life who is interested in being a performer, being in theater, being in music, I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, But I think you really gift them so much when you make sure that there is a responsible adult whose only intention is to support them Hmm. with them at all times when they're doing these endeavors. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I I love that you did the rhythm and blues though. You know, I'm a big, massive fan of people (laughs) like Justin Timberlake and Al Green. I I went down Mm. Beale Street in Memphis when I was traveling. Loved it. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, yeah so mm-hmm. good. It must have been felt weird. So you didn't give permission then for when that person essentially what stole your music. You, yeah. You, you, yeah. That's that insane. Happens. But that happens. Yeah, but it does, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's wow. it, you know, especially so when you're young did and that... you're not as protective of your of your stuff. You're just sharing yeah. it. You're just hopeful that someone's gonna pick it up and you kind of make assumptions that when yeah. they pick it up they're going to give you your due, um, due credit, but you know, it's just a lesson you learn in the business. Yeah. Could, could have been the pivotal one though. They hadn't have stolen it. Right. (laughs) Yeah, maybe. Um, but I think think also when I look, 
Yeah. When I look back at my life, um, even the challenges, they all seem to have been pushing me in the correct direction. So I don't um I don't wish anything was was different in my life because I'm I'm so happy where I am right now and I would not jeopardize this place for for anything. So I accept life's challenges and I want to grow through them and just see see what's what's coming next. Sure. Um, just quickly though, be, going back to the personal um, event that you dreadfully had to go through when you was raped, and you said then you had to deal with the 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 um, the next day. Uh, and you, in the moment, the way you mm -hmm. said it, it sounded like you dealt with that pretty well. But did that affect you at any point, even down the track? Did it did it come back to haunt you at any way at any point in your life and and, and maybe triggers that present to you later on? How did you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I think it certainly, uh, from a day to day standpoint, affected my feelings of self worth. You know what mm -hmm. what did I have to offer? You know how could I expect to be treated? Um, because even my response to what happened to me is pretty telling for where my mindset was as far as to, you know, what had happened, who was in the wrong. I was really taking on responsibility for something that I did not do. Um, I was taking on shame and blame for something that was not mine. It was something that happened to me, not because of me. Um, but yeah. because of where my mindset was, I, I didn't fully accept the truth of that. And I, I took on that burden and I think I carried that for decades after I think it informed, you know, things that I allowed in my marriage, um, and in my relationship. And I got to a point in that relationship where things were happening that were crossing my personal boundaries to the degree where it felt similar to that transgression, right? It felt um, like an assault to my personhood, an assault to me in other ways, and it just was red line. I, I can't. And I had never shared with anyone that this had happened to me in my entire life. And I shared with this person just as kind of a, a Hail Mary, <laughs> like, please, I can't, I can't experience this. This can't be the dynamic in my personal relationship. This thing happened to me when I was a teenager. I've never told anyone about it before. And um, I just need to have safety in my relationship. I can't feel um, that I am being um, harmed in this way. I can't feel that I'm being disrespected in this way. It brings me back. It triggers me back to this memory. Um, and then I think it's really important that we understand when we are asking someone to treat us like a human and for bare minimum respect, we've already learned what we need to know, right? You should not have to ask someone to treat you with respect. You should not have to tell someone that you've been raped for them to alter their behavior, right? And so yeah. the only thing I did and the only thing most of us do when we almost beg for respect using these vulnerable moments is we just give more ammunition to the person who's not respecting us. And later, most likely it will be used. And I know in my case, um, that information ended up being, you know, in a public display. I won't go into exactly the details of that, but that became public information. Um, to try to, you know, create um, a persona of who I was to defend this person's actions. Um, but, you know, again, just like everything else in life, I really learned from that, that, you know, when, I, when you are begging someone for respect, begging someone to treat you with dignity, that, that mistake is on you, right? If you should not be begging for respect, if someone is not giving you respect, you really need to turn inward, reflect on whether that's something that is in alignment with who you want to be, how you want to live your life, and then make choices that often include not having a relationship with that person any longer to regain your dignity and not ask them for it back because they're already not 
not respecting it. So again, just like everything else in my life, that was a really important lesson. And now I'm I'm so grateful because I think having those negative experiences has really led me to a point where I will not accept that in my life. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.